Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is David Breer, and welcome to episode 36 of the 11FS FinTech Insider Breakfast Show, brought to you this morning by our good friends over at MyTech. MyTech delivers bank grade identity verification with the highest possible assurance levels, massively reducing risk, fraud, and costs. In this show, we bring you the best and the brightest from around the FinTech and banking landscape every single day straight into your homes at 8.30 BST, here live on LinkedIn Live. Today, I am thrilled to be joined by Gemma Godfrey, who is a business advisor and fintech entrepreneur extraordinaire. Uh, I added the extraordinaire, but it sounded about right, Gemma. Honestly, I'm seeing you everywhere at this stage. In today's show, what we'll be doing is catching up with Gemma on her pretty fascinating career journey. Uh, you've, the arc you've taken is, is pretty amazing. What it is to work with Arnold Schwarzenegger on The Apprentice and how she sees the adapting landscape to everything that's happening with the pandemic. So first and foremost, Gemma, how's it going? I mean, it's interesting times. I think we're all adapting to the new normal and I think embracing a bit of chaos. So um, yeah. Definitely that. I mean, it feels like um, me and you and I think about four or five other people had dinner about three years ago, didn't we? Can you remember? And it was a nice Italian restaurant near Liverpool Street. And uh, that feels like about 10 years ago now, doesn't it? Which is quite quite scary. But uh, so yeah. much has changed in that period of time. Who thought the entire world would be locked down by this stage? Hey? Well, I don't think people would have really like, thought this was going to happen in you know how many months ago either. I think it's just been a, a completely dra drastic change. I think it's an unprecedented time, but really, you know, it's a time where you know people that can adapt will be able to do well, and people that aren't are really going to struggle. So um, you know, a lot of people out there I think need some help and some guidance. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think our journeys have accelerated over the last few years, and uh, and uh, it's, yeah, let's see what happens. Just a bit, for sure. It's been very fun. Um, as always, guys, we love getting your questions. So over on LinkedIn, chuck them in the comments. We'll weave them into the, the conversation as we go. Um, and speaking of questions, actually, it's time to reveal the winner of the question of the week that we had last week. Super, super happy to announce that uh, Raul Mudholka, I think his name is. Uh, I think you've tuned into literally every one of these broadcasts since it began uh, over in India, I believe, from uh, from where you've been telling us you've been tuning in from every morning. Really, really good question for Dennis Govan, who's the CEO of MoxBank. Uh, Raul, if you send us send us an email on podcast at 11fs.com, we'll get the swag out to you uh, today. All right, guys, uh, enough of me talking. Gemma, give us a bit of your background because, I mean, you've gone from quantum physics into all of the things you're doing now. Like, give us a bit of a, 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 an overview. Okay, all right, well, that's a bit of a challenge. So let's just see. Um, so I'll try and do it uh, in a short way without boring people. So basically what I'm doing right now is I'm advising business owners, government, and the public on how to navigate the changing business and financial environment, which obviously times like this is quite um, well needed. I was previously the head of investment strategy for a publicly listed wealth manager, but I left it to found um, a digital investing service, which I then sold within three years. So I led it through uh, multiple rounds of funding, FCA authorization, new product launches, and integration into the acquiring company, who were then acquired by another company, um, who are the world's largest outsourced asset manager with about 15 trillion of assets under um, advisement. So kind of went through all of that while having my second child, getting divorced, and moving house so <laughs> I mean, yeah it's uh, it's been quite interesting and i think what i'm doing right now is um i've launched another venture i've launched another venture for the times and sunday times called times money mentor another website to help people afford the life that they want um and yeah as i said advising government but also what i'm really really enjoying is uh, being a board advisor to ceos of companies like high growth companies to try and you know pass on uh, the business knowledge that i gained over the last few years to try and help them achieve their milestones so mm. Yeah, it's busy. It's very busy with you know, the kids running around and also, you know, coming into certain conference calls and um, live broadcasts as well. So it's, you know, it's fun time. I mean, if you're going to do it all, you might as well do it all, I guess, at that stage, yeah. haven't you? I mean, I, I was saying to you just before we went on, I loved your, if for anybody who hasn't seen the video, uh, head over to, to Gemma's uh, LinkedIn profile. Uh, Gemma was doing a, a live radio show and, and Gemma, one of your kids walked in, didn't they? Yeah, I mean, so I, I cut off, so it's like a 10 second clip to see, you know, how I kind of dealt with that. I basically like swept them up and then, you know, took them out and then literally carried on um, actually with the interview as well. Uh, but you don't see the, the minute beforehand of the look of absolute fear on my face. <laughs> that my three-year-old daughter Sloan was about to scream and I just thought, anyway, so yeah, it was all well, you know, it ended up well. But you know, you're getting your daughter Ivy as well involved, I think, in what you're doing. I, I am, yeah. I mean, I, I love the, the fact that you didn't even, like, there wasn't even a, like a wobble in your voice though. You like absolutely smashed it. So uh, I, I think such a such a difference, I'm not, I'm not going to make this a uh, what mum does and what dad does thing, but 
that the guy on the BBC didn't handle it so well, I have to say. So uh, well, well done for, for picking that one up so well. I mean, what, one of the things that, I, I mean, I, I remember this one sort of coming out of nowhere, really, but you were on the US Apprentice as well. Like you're an, uh, an advisor to Arnold Schwarzenegger. Like where did that come from? And that was like, must have been such a weird experience. How was he? Um, okay, so best experience, bucket list experience. Um, yeah. It's like being in a dream. You know how sometimes you're in a dream where you're in a TV show and Arnold Schwarzenegger's turning to you and saying, who should I fire? You know, that actually was my real life for like a couple of months, was it four wow. years ago, something like that. Um, uh, the funny thing is, and I think this is true of anything in any industry, you know, it takes years to be, you know, do something overnight. So what no one really saw was the years of, you know, pitching different TV show ideas, kind of building up, honing in my skills, networking, you know, again, trying to make that happen. Um, because I just really believe that there was an opportunity to help, you know, mainstream audiences, you know, engage with money and business. So look, I loved it. Um, he was really inspiring. Uh, and I think, I, again, I, I, I learned a lot, I guess, over those, uh, you know, few days, few weeks. It was fantastic. Yeah, like you say, it must, it must have felt like a, a strange dream. I mean, whatever, Whatever Arnie tells you to do, I'm sure you like. You're like who? Who like you decide who you want to fire, Mr. Schwarzenegger? Yeah. You know, so exactly, exactly. Don't fire, don't terminate me. Yep, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, you like say with the the work that you're doing with your experience, uh, and actually, like you say, I mean, there's not many people who have scaled the company so quickly to you know to to exit. Um, you know, like say that in passing that knowledge on to more people, you know, the board advisor roles that you're doing, maybe if we sort of talk about that a little bit, because I think lots of people think, and you've been through, you know, the whole cycle, lots of people think entrepreneurship is like a beautiful, you know, Steve Jobs, Elon Musk kind of vibe. But every day there's sort of trials and, and tribulations, particularly as you're hyperscaling a company, right? And what, what type of um, advice would you give people? I mean, in, in normal times, this is hard, but in the times that we're living in now with everything that's happening with the pandemic, it's its quite a stressful job. Yeah, I agree. It's not the, hey, I'm going to start off doing something in my garage, tinkering around and, oh, wow, it's a billion dollar company. Yeah, that <laughs> often happen. It is blood, sweat and tears. And, and uh, it's really funny. And I say this, and when I say this to other entrepreneurs, you know, it kind of seems to resonate, which is if someone told me before I started what it was going to be like, Hell no. I mean, you know, I kind of I kind of jumped in completely a little bit naively, which I think you kind of need um, to, to kind of go on this journey because it is absolutely grueling. You know, you're on your own. It's incredibly lonely as a CEO, which again is why and if I'm building up more board positions as well. So if there's anybody out there that you know thinks I can help them, very happy to. Because I think it is really lonely. Um, you know, you can't always talk to your staff, you can't necessarily talk to your investors. About what's going on because people look to you to really kind of instill confidence in what's going on in the business so um, and there's no manual and I think that's really hard I'm a scientist I wanted to know what was the equation for success and you just you know and especially when you're launching a new product or creating a new market of course there's not going to be a manual either but kind of reaching out to people that have been through tough times I think is a really important thing as well you know people are busy don't just go for the success stories but people that have been burned that can pass on to you you know the things that they found hard with is really important but I think look Ultimately, and again, this, this applies to everyone with their fi personal finances as well as their business. When times are uncertain, it's good to take control where you can. And I think it's very hard to focus, again, times like this, um, it's very hard to be able to rely on revenues, but what you can do is cut costs. You know, controlling costs can make people feel better, but also, you know, utilizing technology and looking for the opportunity is really important as well. And I think small businesses, while of course very vulnerable on the financial side, are in the most strongest position to be able to exploit opportunities and be more nimble. And also, and again, this is why I did in the business, we pivoted three or four different times in terms of the audience we we're gonna go after. And my view was always, how, what, what's your end goal and how can you build value in the business? Uh, mm. And I think that's really important to focus on. So for me, it wasn't get millions of customers. It was, can I build the best technology? And if I can do that and build value there that I knew that other companies couldn't, well, you know, partnering up with a company or being bought by a company that has the customers, you know, would be a, a more natural um, way forward. So, yeah, a kind of a, a lot to unpick, and it is really, really hard, um, and it's a roller coaster, and it is ugly yeah. at times. But well, well, it's it's interesting. At like say at the end of that, uh, you know, having exited a company, at the end of it, you realise, I guess, the different things that you've learned over that period. Because I, I think it's um, it's interesting, particularly I think for people who have got 
uh, you know, big corporate experience. Corporates, you know, the, there's a there's a tide and things kind of move quite quickly. But in a, a really hyperscaling company like uh, you had b- before, then actually things things change week on week on week on week. You know, you add another fifty people, the dynamic of the business changes. You know, the the lessons that we've had from Eleven FS's perspective, from you know five people to 200 people the world is just dynamically different in terms of what's there so it's it's interesting like say for for people and and like say anybody who can offer advice then uh, you know Gemma like where, where should people get in touch if they're looking for for support on that type of thing reach out my LinkedIn profile I mean I've, I've capped out in terms of connections but um but I've opened it up publicly you can message me so anybody can message me directly um and uh, and start to talk so yeah very good. Uh, I mean, it's a super difficult time, I guess, for businesses all around. And, and like you say, SMEs have been hit pretty hard. I know the you know the government is doing quite a lot with the sort of re- the loans and bounce back loans. And but there's there's various different sort of catches with these different things. I mean, how how would or how should a business do you think sort of navigate this? Because strategy in this time is is pretty difficult, isn't it? Raising capital, hiring new people. Like like you say, the the only thing really that's completely in your control is the cost side isn't it yeah it is and look it's, it's amazing that there's government support out there but a lot of the things that the government's offering are loans rather than grants and there's a massive difference that stuff, there's no such thing as a free lunch you know some of these things will have to be repaid um and and, and a startup business where you know capital is so precious especially if you're regulated and you have to hold regular regulatory capital you know mm-hmm. things get quite tough and i think I think what I would say is, again, is that there are multiple routes to go down. Um, it's not just about growing for the sake of growing. And of course, for the very early stage small businesses, you know, raising capital is very, very important um, because you need to be able to validate your proposition. But um, again, this was, this was a decision that I came to, which was there's also a risk further down the line of just ending up in a hamster wheel um, of continuing to raise more capital, which means your valuation gets higher, which means actually naturally you are ruling out other strategic partners and you've just got to ask yourself what you're looking for. So is it if it's money only, fantastic. But if it's money plus strategic advice, plus, I mean, for us, it was we wanted distribution. Um, in that case, you know, it's more about actually getting people on board that can really help with the business. And I just don't think people should shy away. And I, I know there's this thing about, oh, if you're a startup entrepreneur, you know, you should be out there trying to disrupt. And that's great, but I also think working with the larger corporates um, to be able to provide them and add value and be able to, you know, uh, kind of bring stability to your business shouldn't just be underestimated. And I think that's um, a really good way to, you know, you know, stabilize the business and be able to grow in the way that you want to as well. Definitely. I mean, it's the um, sort of Clayton Christensen 101, isn't it? Uh, if you can be the innovation and you can work with the big incumbents on distribution, then that's a pretty happy place to be, isn't it? Because you you both benefit from that in terms of what they can kind of bring to it. I mean, within the financial services industry, I'd say many of the really big organizations are, are kind of looking at that now. I mean, I, I guess the incumbents are in a, a quite an interesting situation here, which is uh, probably startups are going to be more and more open to that because of the, you know, the inevitable sort of economic downturn, aren't they? So actually, the the time for partnerships of that scale is is probably better now than ever, because customers will still recognize those brands. Um, but actually, it gives those innovative partners a, a, a kind of a, an exit without necessarily needing to sell the business, right? Exactly. And it's interesting because the beauty is that you have certain strength, different strengths on both sides of it. And it's like, you know, because ultimately, um, the ability, and again, this is why I, I, I left, I was a, um, a you know, publicly listed wealth manager. And the reason why, and again, you know, I was having conversations with, with the big banks that were trying to solve a problem. And my view was, let me go, solve the problem, and then come back. Um, because doing it within the infrastructure with all the bureaucracy, you know, it, the asset that small businesses have is um, time. They can do things faster, quicker, cheaper. And then, and then if you can do that, to then be able to partner up um, is a really strong proposition. And again, I think that's why I wanted to do the whole life cycle, which is not just be, you know, on the startup side, start up a business and sell it, but I wanted to integrate it within a really, really one of the biggest corporates in the world to, again, understand and navigate that, to be able to showcase how you can, how you can integrate technology in the right way to be able to leverage it rather than kind of quash the innovation. And I think that's a really delicate balancing act that corporates are finding, which is how do they allow that to flourish, the entrepreneurialism, but in an environment where they are heavily regulated and they have to be able to put the parameters in place that they can control it. So, mm. yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, when you, like I say, you've seen both sides of the fence. I mean, when you're in a big incumbent, there's a thousand reasons why you can't do something, whether it's, you know, the regulator won't allow it or our technology is, you know, not allowing us to do those things. But like you say, on the startup side, you, you do realize that. I think, I, I always think it's like that everything within a big incumbent comes down to culture. 
it's the that's the major inhibitor because they've got all of the money and all of the customers and actually if they could almost get out of their own way to allow these things to happen then there's no nobody should be threatened by a startup if you can actually get the culture right in an incumbent yeah yeah and look i don't think we can i kind of underestimate the, how important it is to get the culture right because you know there is a there can be a lot of attitude in big companies which is computer says no which is mm -hmm. literally the antithesis of the way that startups think which is if the computer says no i'm going to find a better way of doing it um but but again i just think that's again why it's so important to kind of for me to have, have navigated that to be able to see what worked well what didn't work well um so again be able to advise you know big corporates as well in terms of how do you how do you actually allow this cult allow the culture to flourish allow that entrepreneurial people to be entrepreneurial um, but at the same time fit in with your regulatory and your compliance framework so i think it's a really good opportunity as you said in this type of environment that people will be will tend to be more collaborative because they'll understand that they have different strengths and actually if you work together you'll be able to solve the problem on a much bigger scale and i think that's okay. what ultimately we all want to do i agree uh, you're a, a mum of two how old are you two uh, then, uh, so Sloan is three. She was the one that gate crashed the uh, live broadcast, and Dexter is almost seven. Almost seven. Oh, okay. So my mine's uh, eight and six. So, so similar similar sort of ages. I mean, I, they don't get any easier in terms of like the, uh, the the sort of entertaining and everything that sort of comes with it. But I mean, how have you found all of this period? Because there's there's some benefits, isn't there? Like the working from home side of things. I mean, have you have you found it? uh how have you found sort of matching these these two things because obviously with a a, a a career where you're doing lots of kind of recordings and things are you finding that balance good or uh, or is it uh, is it quite testing i think i think it's hard for everyone and i also think what my, my hope would be that this really does level the whole gender thing because i think it's hard it's hard for parents full stop you know kids want their, their fathers and their mothers you know they're going to be running in um, either way and i and i think and I, it's funny i think we spoke about this just before we came on air which is um, I think it's going to increase the amount of understanding people have and actually a bit more relaxed, make people a bit more relaxed about, you know, you have a conference call, but actually if things interrupt it, things interrupt it, you know, fitting things around life. Um, your life is is going to be, I think, more of the norm working more remotely. So, look, it's a juggling act, but I would hope that this means that the culture will shift from FaceTime, from people thinking that, you know, you have to be in an office to be able to show your worth. But and actually, it's more about what you deliver. And I know not all jobs can do that. I know some jobs you do have to have, you know, you know, especially in the service industry. But I would hope that that kind of shifts things. And I think for people, people that have gone paternity leave or whatever it is, that actually there's a great um, enablement for people to, um, check in, use technology to be able to, you know, maintain their careers as well as their family aspirations as well. So, look, I think it's a tough time and a juggle, but I think we're all in it and we're all in it together. And I would hope that this would actually, this at least this one element means that after the pandemic, there'll be a greater change for good. Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting, isn't it? There's uh, we we've definitely sort of found with with what we're doing with Eleven FS is companies who were um, maybe quite scared of doing work with people remotely in a very different way has actually they've just realized that i mean everybody is remote at this period of time so actually they're they're sort of opening up in a in, a, in actually a way that i didn't really expect them to given uh, you would expect given this downturn people would sort of tighten up a little bit more but i guess um you know we're in a situation where the the pandemic has kind of impacted people a little bit differently in in various different ways hasn't it so do, do you see I mean, actually, there's been lots of work and lots of kind of studies around things like gender pay gaps and things like um, different opportunities being offered to different demographics and different genders. I mean, this play, it sort of levels the playing field for a, a period of time, doesn't it? Where actually everybody can have the same opportunities potentially as, as anybody else. Do you, do you think that will make a difference in the long term? I think in an environment like this, the thing that's going to separate people and the skills that are really valued are, I mean, first of all, I think, you know, key workers and things like that, I think people are going to be appreciating, you know, people that, you know, nurses teach a lot more than they did before, which I think is obviously a good thing. And then in terms of, in terms of, as you said, gender parity in the business, the workplace, people that can work remotely, people that have uh, the, the skills to be able to continue to like motivate themselves, the people that are focused on creating solutions in this environment that again leverage technology, those are the things that are going to be more valued than just your gender, I think. So I, I do think it's an interesting time. I think obviously for women, you know, being uh, historically underpaid, um, having not invested as much money, and also I think 
there's research showing less likely to exploit these opportunities in terms of putting money back into the market will hold people back financially. But from a business perspective, I think if anybody that is able to kind of ride this out and use this as an opportunity to, I mean, you know, produce more content online, uh, decide what is it, what problem can they then help people solve? I think that will be much more powerful um, a longer term. Um, but it, interesting, if we talk about kind of government support, the only thing that does make me a bit nervous is things like uh, bounce back loans, uh, certain loans that the government's you know, sending out to people. If you're a startup, you need to have raised money before. That's one of the criteria. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, and I think the fact that only 1% of money went to women last year means that they're going to be disproportionately you know, discriminated against. And the fact that they then need to find match funding. And again, historically, it's harder for women to have found. Uh, and I know personally, you know, the number of times I sat in meetings, you know, with, let's say a, a male colleague or somebody that maybe was brand new to the business, uh, or was just the you know capital introducer or something like that, and all the questions were you know targeted at them rather than the person running the business. I mean, I have some horror stories, but once we get through that, um, you know, I, I do think this you know is a challenging time. But um, and, I, and again, that's my nervousness around it. But I think on a whole, um, I would hope that people would value skill sets rather than um, you know anything else around it, which which you know should hopefully put people level the playing field a little bit more as well. It's um, I mean, it's it's horrible to hear stories like that. I mean, even because yeah, I mean, I, you, I've spoken to sort of many people about. We had um, uh, Dame Jane Angardia on uh, a couple of weeks ago, and actually, she was talking about you know moments in her career where she's seen it, and similar conversations with Alison Rose at, at NatWest. But they they sort of have framed most of those conversations as past. To hear, you know, from your experience in the last you know five six years, where you where you've had moments like that, it's just it's just bizarre, and I. I, I kind of don't comprehend what goes through people's minds in today's, you know, day and age that actually they would they would even have those predispositions. Do you know what I mean? It, it seems it seems like it's a much more ingrained thing than people really can convey. But um, I mean, you you clearly um, showed them. Right. Uh, and actually uh, it went uh, it's gone rather well in terms of all the other sides of things. But uh, what, what do you think drives people to to sort of have those um, misconceptions? I mean, I think, I don't know, there's a little bit of human nature, which is people like to invest in people like them, that look like them, that talk like them, which is why you end up with this kind of like network of same people that invest in the same companies. Okay, that, the reason why obviously that's a bit short-sighted is that you then miss out on the opportunity to really, serve, to really invest in a company that's servicing customer needs because customers are of all backgrounds, you know, and you, and you need to have people running the business that, that, that reflect that and that understand the customer because ultimately that's what drives success. Um, so, so I don't know, I mean, it's a network, it's, uh, you know, it's hard to break into people invest, you know, with people that they know and things like that. Mm -hmm. But I just think, I think that, you know, I, I hopefully, as, as you said, you know, I didn't want to have investors on board that were like that. I wanted people that really understood the proposition and they were coming on board because it was a really great business opportunity rather than anything else around that. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it, it was. I think I think I could say that it was harder to raise capital, but it meant that I got some smarter money on board. I got people yeah. that really got it, that really challenged us, kept us to our KPIs, and made sure that we were going to be be able to deliver. And that was mm. really valuable. I mean, I think there's something that in there. I'm sure, there must be something in there that of almost like I think the people who act in that way must have a predisposition that they believe that they're right at everything, because. Um, I mean, one of my principles with 11FS is just hire smarter people than me, because if I only hired people around me like me, we'd really be in trouble, quite frankly, you know? So uh, so essentially bringing in smarter people to fill those gaps. I think if, you, if you're only looking to invest in organizations, you must presume that you're so smart, you know? So which is a bad way of doing business for sure. Uh, loads and loads of questions for you over on uh, LinkedIn, Gemma. So I'm gonna kind of rattle through a few of these, but um, what do you look, for from an early stage investor what's the the types of things obviously not being sexist would be a good one um that would be definitely high up there on the uh, the list of don'ts would be great but what what other things do, do you sort of look for in that space because like you say your your strategic nature of the investors you were looking for i think is it, it stands apart from just the the money side right yeah, I mean, also, I mean, in some cases, I guess I was married for a bit longer, but in some cases, you could end up with these investors longer than you are married, you know? So I think getting the mix right is really, really, really important because um, especially, especially the earlier investors, and it's interesting because I think those are the ones we tend to give less regard to because at that point, people, you know, especially young businesses just want the money, but actually these are the people that are gonna be with you the longest and they need, to, they need to back you. They need to back you, they need to understand, and they need to understand the business model. They need to understand that the business model will change. They need to be comfortable with that. They need to trust you. 
Um, and they and they obviously they need to be able to come on the journey with you because you know you are going to have to make strategic decisions along the way, and they're hard. And being a CEO is unbelievably hard. And the last thing you want to do is battle. And you hear that this all the time. But you don't want to be battling with with your investors. You want them to be able to to back you. And again, you know, I had some, I had some fantastic ones. I remember you know in the latter days when it came to you know we were looking at all different options actually. Um, you know we were we were looking at there was a, a, a fundraise on the table. There was. <laughs> We were approached about going uh, public, which, you know, I mean, even I thought was, oh, I think the market's a bit overheated. Um, mm -hmm. Or there was a sale and actually having really intelligent discussions with, um, you know, with my backers that had actually been there before, that, were entre that had been entrepreneurs themselves and understood the life cycle and could give me some sage advice and really just a bit of empathy as well. It gives you the confidence. And I think, you know, again, if you're, especially if you're carving out a new, a completely new um, path, to have people that you know can instill in you the confidence that you you know you can make the right decisions and they will back you for that, I think is really important. So look, we're not all as lucky as that. Sometimes it is just down to just get the money in the door, get the money in the door, keep the lights on, get get to the next stage and the next milestone. But I think again, if I come back to what is your end goal? So if you are, for example, I guess here's one of the big uh, missteps. I, I we didn't do this ourselves, but I'm just saying I can see out in the market is. You know, if you are out there because you want to sell your business, having investors on board that believe they're backing a, a unicorn, again, that can have issues further down the line. So you just have to be really honest and open where you want to get the business to, where you believe it could go to, but also that there will be times when the strategy will have to change. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, like you say, there's a there's a very different dynamic there if you get the wrong investors in that stage, isn't there? Um, De Deval Gore uh, from London and Partners actually said, uh, morning, Gemma, uh, there's clearly no manual for, for success in this side, but do you see common patterns and missteps from startups in, in, in your experience and the, the people that you've sort of seen in this space? Obviously, that would be one of them, getting the wrong investors on board. But um, do you think there's there's... I mean, there's a common thread there to the stuff that you've been talking about, which is know where you're going, right? Where, what's your aim? What, sh what are you aiming for in terms of an exit or a, you know, a long term? Is this a lifestyle business or is it a change the world piece? Um, is there anything else that you sort of see sort of common mistakes that people make? Honestly, it's uh, it's as simple as this: trying to do it all. Um, it's again, we were very fortunate because when we started the business, there were others in the market that, you know, some were doing well, some weren't doing well. And it's very, very important to, to also take, take note where people aren't, you know, companies aren't doing well. And what we thought was it was when um, they were trying to do too much. So it, they were trying to grow their customer base, which meant put it, pumping a lot of money into advertising. But at the same time, trying to grow the technology and doing both of them is so hard. And so what we wanted to do is be laser focused on the technology, you know, really, really build that and really add, add value to the business that way. I, I'm, I'm going to also equate it to the environment right now in terms of a pandemic. You know, again, there are certain things you can't do anymore. So be laser focused on if you can't add value to your business the way you used to, how can you do it now? And I think and I think that's it, because and, and by the way, this isn't the fault of the, of the CEOs of these businesses. Um, you know, especially when you're raising money or, or you're out there speaking the whole time, people will constantly ask you certain questions about different um, success metrics. You know, they'll they'll be asking you about, okay, how much is it costing you to acquire a customer? Or how many customers do you have on board? Or how much have you raised? Or, you know, um, or have you have you uh, licensed any of your technology? Whatever it is, there'll be something. And I think it's very, very easy to try and win over all those discussions and try and add value and, and tick off all those boxes. And you have to have the confidence to say, listen, that's not my metric. That's not that's not how I'm adding value. Um, as I said, you know, we said, look, we're going to get distribution a different way. I want to try and get distribution free, you know, a free distribution route by our employers, as we ended up doing, mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, they'd give us access to customers rather than us having to go out and pay for them through advertising. And it gave us the, the space to be able to build, you know, what we believe uh, and we still believe is, you know, was world class um, technology. So I think that's another thing, maybe it's just being a bit confused as to what you're, you know, what, what value uh, you're trying to build. Agree. Uh, a good question here from uh, Paul Loberman. He said, uh, really liking the new financial well-being initiative. Looks great. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about it and um, how many companies are getting involved to, to support this so far? So I think I think you're talking about the, the latest thing that I've launched in terms of um, because there's two different things that we're working on for financial well-being. So on one hand, um, I'm advising government, so the UK government on um, how to improve the financial well-being of the UK population. So it's a 10 year strategy. Yeah. Uh, and that's, yeah, it's, it's a massive aim. And obviously right now, you know, people getting into more debt, we're doing payment holidays, people, you know, obviously having to pause on their savings and investments is obviously it's a ma massive concern. So on that respect, there's definitely more and more companies that are buying into the need for financial well-being because they realize it's affecting the performance of their staff. If you don't look after their mental health, which means and me most people worry about money, then you're just not going to get, you know, what you need to do to be able to have that, you know, nurturing environment and really productivity off the back of that. So it's definitely raising a lot of uh, momentum that side. 
And then in terms of what I'm doing on the Times, the Times is a website called Times Money Mentor. Um, it's outside the paywall. I was really adamant about that. I wanted it to be accessible to people because I didn't want people to pay. I wanted it to be, you know, you do it via corporates. Corporates want to advertise or, you know, or sponsor content or have an affiliate deal. You know, that's that's where you get the money from. Um, so it's free for everyone to be able to go on board and actually understand if you're having a career change, a lifestyle change, a change in your relationship, getting married, getting divorced, what does it mean for your money? And then also it goes all the way through to independent product reviews. And obviously we work with lots of corporates that are there, um, but they're independently ranked. So all their products are, you know, and again, it's done by an independent company out there. Uh, so that again, people can get access to products um, that will solve the need as well. So, um, and again, I, a lot of people are coming on board. So I agree with the, the ethos that, you know, financial well-being is just, it's, you know, I was surprised, even though when I was, you know, back uh, uh, with my old company that I started, about how quickly uh, it had really taken off, and the fact that people had acknowledged that it is a key, financial well-being is a key need, mental health, physical health is the third pillar, and it underlies all of them. So um, I'd say, yeah, I, nowadays it's part of an overall overall well-being strategy, which is why I sold the business um, to one of the world's largest um, employee benefit companies. Fantastic. I mean, it's it is it is amazing. Again, I, I think I said this just before we came on. I've no like I can barely keep up with you on social media. Never mind actually keep up with you in terms of your your work ethic. So it's been amazing to see all the things that you've been doing, Gemma. Congratulations on all the success that you've had. It's uh, it's uh, an absolute joy to to sort of keep watching you uh, watching you uh, rise. I think like your advice to where uh, you know to, to startups in terms of knowing where you want to get to. I mean, like prime minister at some point, Gemma. Do you think? <laughs> Now, I, I, I'm happy to advise the Prime Minister, but that is a jo one job I would not want. Oh my God, that, that and be a football manager. No. <laughs> Well, like you say, if, uh, if being a CEO is isolating, then definitely being the Prime Minister definitely is. But uh, all right, folks, uh, I'm afraid it's coming to the top of the hour, so we're going to have to let you guys go. So uh, let's just take a, a moment to say thank you to, to Gemma. Like, huge thank you so much for coming on. Uh, massive round of applause for everything that you've done in terms of the, the work there. So congratulations on all the things you've done. Gemma, can you tell people where they can find out a little bit more about you and all the work that you're doing right now? So I post a lot of content, a lot of tips um, all across my social media. So on Instagram, on Twitter, on Facebook as well. And do follow me on LinkedIn. As I said, I'm capped out in terms of connections, but you can follow me and always direct message me as well. I'd love to hear from you, especially if there are any other businesses out there that I can help. Fantastic. All right, guys, uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Tomorrow, I'm going to be joined by Mr. InsureTech himself, Nigel Walsh, partner at Deloitte uh, Consulting, to talk about everything that's been happening in with the insurance side of things, with everything that's happening in the crisis right now. If there's anybody else that you fancy me getting on the show, uh, either tag them in the comments or just email me and CC them in on david at 11fs.com. That's all we have for you today. Stay safe and we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Goodbye.